Now that I've given you a basic overview of Java synchronization in general, it's time to start talking about the different types of Java synchronizer capabilities. And you'll see that we're going to kind of group these together into four main categories, atomic operations, mutual exclusion operations, coordination operations, and barrier synchronization. And each of these different categories or different types of, of categories will give us a way to solve different kinds of synchronization problems using Java mechanisms. So atomic operations, as we'll see, are defined to be actions that happen either all at once or not at all. And the metaphor for this, of course, will be a transporter beam from Star Trek, if you're familiar with that, or splinching, or sorry, not splinching, uh, apparating and disapparating if you're a Harry Potter fan. We'll also talk about mutual exclusion, which allows concurrent access and update to shared mutable data or shared mutable state without the challenge and hazard of incurring race conditions. And we'll see the metaphor here is basically having uh, a restroom on an airplane where there's one person in there at a time and people basically queue up and take turns going in and coming out. So that's mutual exclusion. The third type of synchronizer category we have in Java is coordination, which as we just talked about in the previous lesson, ensures that computations run properly in the right order, at the right time, under the right conditions and so on. And we'll see that the metaphor here is kind of passing of the baton to coordinate the actions. And then the fourth and final category of synchronizers in Java are the so-called barrier synchronizers which ensure that any thread or threads have to stop at a certain point and they can't proceed until all the other threads have reached the same barrier. And, and a good example of this would be the starting gate for horses at a race or the starting blocks for people who are gonna run the 100 meter dash or a marathon or whatever, where they all have to start from a common point and then when the starting gun fires, they all start together. So that's a good example of a barrier. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So let's first talk about atomic ordering. So atomicity in this context means that an action either happens all at once atomically, or it doesn't happen at all. And that's sometimes called linearization. That's another term for that. If you go look that up on Wikipedia, you'll find a link at the bottom of the slide here that talks about linearization, which is basically atomic ordering. And what we want to do here is we want to make sure that the operations on a field in one thread will occur all at once or not at all with respect to operations on the same field in other threads. So let's take a look at an example to kind of make this less abstract. So you can see here we've got a long field, which could be a counter or whatnot, which starts out initially with the value zero. And then we've got thread one and we've got thread two, and they're going to share this field and they're going to go ahead and try to increment it. And they're both going to try to increment the field. So if, if all goes well and you get lucky, this is the way it would work. Thread one is going to read the value of the field, which starts at at zero. It's going to increase the value by one, which will do it in its local cache. And then it'll write that value back to the to the main field in global memory, in main memory, that'll then increment the value to one. Thread two comes along, it reads the current value of that field, which is one, it increments it by one, which increments it in the cache, and then it writes it back. Okay, so far, so good, right? Well, if you don't use atomic operations, you will not get this nice ordering. Instead, you're gonna get things all jumbled up. And we'll talk later about what happens when things get jumbled up because uh, chaos and insanity will ensue. Atomic ordering is supported in Java by the Java atomic package. And there's atomic Boolean, atomic integer, atomic reference, atomic long, there's a whole bunch of atomics. And you'll actually get a chance to play around with these atomic uh, classes for assignment 1B, where you use this to implement a spin lock using the atomics in Java. Atomic ordering is also supported by something called the volatile type qualifier. Volatile is a keyword in the Java language, like it is in C and C++, but the semantics of volatile in Java are different 
than the semantics in C and C++. And in particular, when you designate something as volatile in Java, it means that a read or a write to that field will be atomic and it will go through main memory and not be cached. So it, a read from an atomic field means you read it from main memory. A write to an atomic field means you write it to main memory and it won't be stuck in a cache before it's actually stored up in main memory. So that means that the reads and writes are atomic. It doesn't mean other things. And we'll talk about that later. It doesn't mean you can do things like increment it or decrement it atomically. You can just read and write to it atomically. The next category is mutual exclusion. And this is used to prevent simultaneous access to a shared resource, shared mutable state in particular, within a critical section. And the analogy here, of course, is the, the restroom on an airplane. If for another reason, it's easy to remember when you think about it. And if you don't have mutual exclusion, then if two threads come and try to simultaneously do operations in a critical section on the same shared mutable state, then you're gonna end up with race conditions. And a race condition is a, is a hazard that occurs when the correct operation of a program depends on the sequence or the timing of the threads. In other words, if you get lucky, things may work, but if you don't get lucky, things will be inconsistent and corrupted. And of course, inevitably you don't get lucky and you don't get lucky at the most inopportune times, like when you're doing the demo for the customer or when you're trying to update a database and the values get corrupted. So race conditions are very problematic because they tend to occur sporadically and non-deterministically, which makes them very hard to detect and debug. Some examples of what happens with mutual exclusion if you uh, don't have synchronizers is something called read-write conflicts. And here's a simple example of this. This goes back to the example we looked at before. So let's say we have two threads, thread one and thread two, that are sharing a long field. Let's say for sake of argument, the field starts out initialized to zero. And then what'll happen here is that thread one will read the field, increment it by one, and then it will right back to that field at the same time thread two is reading from the field. And the question is, does thread two read the value zero? Does it read the value one? Does it read something in between, <laughs> some random uh, inconsistent value? And the answer is if you don't have synchronization, if you don't ensure mutual exclusion, you don't really know what it's going to be. It's non-deterministic, it's a race condition, it's a bug. And that's what's called a read-write conflict. So two operations conflict if at least one of them is a write and of course is updating the shared mutable state. There's also write-write conflicts, which are similar to read-write conflicts, but they're both writing. So as you can see here, we have thread, t, uh, thread one and thread two. They both read the value of the long field that they share, starts at zero, they both have zero. Thread one increments the field by two, thread two increments the field by one, and then they both write back at the same time. And the question is, is the value there one? Is the value there two? Is the value something in between, some random value that is caused by taking bits of one and two and putting them into memory in some strange way? And the answer is, you don't really know because we have a write-write conflict. This can lead to a problem that's known as lost updates. So if thread T1 writes two and then thread two writes one, the two will be lost because the one will overwrite it. So that's a good example of a lost update. These kinds of problems may seem somewhat esoteric, but in modern multi-core processors, they happen all the time. And the reason for that is that modern multi-core processors have something called weakly ordered memory. And all that means is that the processor memory controller is free to rearrange the order in which operations occur in memory so it no longer corresponds to the order that they showed up in the program, but rather it's the order that the memory controller thinks will be most efficient in order to be able to minimize bus traffic. And so as a consequence, you deliberately get out of order operations unless you explicitly control them through the use of synchronizers. So that's, again, the key theme. This goes back to the discussion we did before about the memory model. Java allows weakly ordered memory to take advantage of multi 
core processor hardware and modern multi-core memory. And if you don't like the non-determinism that comes from that, you need to use synchronizers to gain control over it. Mutual exclusion is supported in Java largely through the Java locks package. So we get Rantrit lock, Rantrit read write lock, stamped lock, and so on and so forth. Mutual exclusion is also supported by the synchronized keyword, which is part of the Java built in monitor object capability. So synchronized methods, synchronized statements, those are all ways of being able to get mutual exclusion as well. The next topic is coordination. This ensures that the computations run properly in the right order, like our ping pong example, at the right time, which would be the case, for example, in a real time program, and under the right conditions. Uh, for example, when resources are available. And basically, you can think of the Palantiri simulator application that you've been using in this class as a great example of something that needs to run under the right conditions. In other words, when there's an available resource or a Palantir to gaze at. Coordination is supported in Java by the Java concurrent and locks packages. And you see things like condition object, which is in the uh, Java concurrent locks package and semaphore, which is in the Java concurrent package. Coordination is also supported by Java's built-in monitor objects, and we'll talk more about them later. As a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from using built-in monitor object coordination mechanisms because they're limited and instead prefer to use the condition object or semaphore features that are part of the Java packages as opposed to built into the Java execution environment or the JVM. And then the fourth and final type of synchronization mechanism is the barrier synchronization mechanisms. And these are the things, again, that ensure that groups of threads coordinate. So they stop at a certain point and then start up as a group. And usually what happens there is you wait until everybody gets to where they need to be, and then they can all start together, which is something called gang scheduling. You can think of barrier synchronization as a variant of coordination that works on groups of threads as opposed to just say pairs of threads. Barrier synchronization is supported in Java by the Java concurrent package in the form of countdown latches, cyclic barriers, and phasers, and later, Parts of the course will give you a chance to play around with some of these things, countdown latches and cyclic barriers, for example. We will cover all of these different synchronizers in the course, starting off, of course, with the most fundamental ones, which are the atomic operations, and then using atomic operations to build mutual exclusion mechanisms. And then you'll also get a chance to play around with other things as we get further along in the course, like coordinators and so on. So that's the end of the Java synchronization overview. Lots of good stuff here, very useful to know, and be aware that what you learn with Java and the synchronizers it supports will help you with other languages and other platforms written in C++ or C Sharp or even C for that matter, or pick your favorite language that has concurrent access. And these mechanisms will typically show up in one form or another, even though the APIs may be slightly different.